Hello everyone, I hope you're all safe and well. My name is Temi Ogunye and I'm a political theory PhD candidate in the government department at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you all for taking the time to join this session. My presentation today is based on the chapter of my PhD. My PhD seeks to provide more concrete guidance about the content of the duty to remedy social injustice. And as you can see, the chapter is titled Towards a Theory of Rule Focused Activism, Insights from Bikiarian Heart. Social injustice obtains because of the patterns of behavior that are widespread in society. These patterns can occur for a number of reasons, but often they are produced in one of two ways, by the members of society either complying or failing to comply with rules. In order to remedy injustice caused by compliance with an unjust rule, members of society, citizens, must be encouraged to abandon the rule, the offending rule. And in order to comply, to remedy an injustice caused by the failure to comply with a just rule, citizens must be encouraged to comply with the rule in question. Rules, therefore, are an important target for those seeking to remedy social injustice. Let us call any act that seeks to change patterns of behaviour and thereby remedy social injustice by encouraging compliance with or abandonment of rules, rule-focused activism. My aim in this paper is to establish the foundations of the theory of rule-focused activism. I assume that the first step in such an effort must be to identify those forms of rule-focused activism that will be effective in different circumstances. In order to be effective, rule-focused activism must be informed by an account of rules and how they govern behaviour in society. Just as it would be imprudent to prescribe a medical intervention designed to remedy a physical ailment with little or no understanding of the human body and the impact of the proposed intervention, so it would be unwise to suggest how rule-focused activism should take place with little or no understanding of rules and their bearing on behaviour. In Norms in the Wild, Christina Bicchieri draws on the influential theory of social norms she develops in the Gramham Society to offer a wide range of suggestions for how to change problematic patterns of behaviour by intervening in social norms. In other words, Bicchieri has begun to establish one of the foundations of what I would call a theory of rule-focused activism. I find Bicchieri's account of how to conceive of and intervene in social norms highly plausible and appealing. The problem, however, at least from the perspective of rule-focused activism, is that there is another kind of rule that is just as, perhaps more likely, to be implicated in social injustice, law. Bicchieri has very little to say about how to conceive of law and does not offer any guidance on how citizens should encourage compliance with and abandonment of law. One of the most influential accounts of how to conceive of law is the theory HLA Hart provides in the, in the concept of law. My strategy in the paper is to bring Bicchieri's and Hart's theories into conversation with each other and eventually integrate them with a view to generating insights relating to how to conceive of and intervene in law. This presentation will only cover part of the argument of the paper and will proceed as follows. First, I outline Bicchieri's account of how to conceive of social norms and state how I think it should be amended. Second, I argue that Bicchieri's account of social norms should be extended to supplement Hart's theory of law. In the paper, I also outline how Bicchieri suggests that we intervene in social norms and draw out the implications of my integration of Bicchieri's and Hart's accounts for a theory of rule-focused activism. I'll skip over that here in the interest of time. Bicchieri's definition of a social norm is, com is complex and the following key ideas are crucial to understanding it. Conditional preferences, empirical expectations, normative expectations, and personal normative beliefs. Preferences, according to Bicchieri, are, quote, dispositions to act in a particular way in a specific situation, end quote. And preferences are conditional when this dis disposition to act in a given way depends on something else being the case. So, to say that I have a conditional preference for queuing is to say that I am disposed to queue, not whenever I must wait to be served, i.e. unconditionally, but only when certain states of affairs, when a certain state of affairs obtains, when other people are queuing, for instance. Expectations are beliefs about what is going to happen in the future, and Bicchieri distinguishes between two kinds, empirical and normative. Empirical expectations are beliefs about what other people do, 
So the belief that most other people will queue is an empirical expectation. Normative expectations of, of, are beliefs about what other people believe should be done. They are therefore second order beliefs, beliefs about beliefs. So the belief that others believe that people should queue is a normative expectation. Bicchieri refers to empirical and normative expectations together as social expectations. Personal normative beliefs are the first order beliefs concerning what should be done that normative expectations are about. These beliefs are not merely prudential according to Bicchieri. Instead, they are more strongly normative beliefs about rules people ought to comply with, whereby compliance with the rule in question, whereby non-compliance with the rule in question elicits disapproval and the likelihood of sanctions. Using these key ideas as building blocks, Bicchieri defines social norms as follows. A behavioral rule is a social norm for a group if a sufficiently large subset of the group prefers to comply with the rule on the condition that, one, they believe that a sufficiently large subset of the group complies with the rule, and two, they believe that a sufficiently large subset of the group believes that the rule should be complied with and may sanction non-compliance. I find Bicchieri's account of how to conceive of social norms plausible and attractive, but I also think it should be implemented. It should be amended. The amendment, I suggest, is quite modest, and instead of motivating it, as I do in the paper, let me just state it here. I suggest we should distinguish between the following three kinds of social norm. The first kind exists when a rule is followed and the beliefs upon which compliance depends are correct. Let us call this a robust social norm to reflect the fact that compliance with the rule is durable, that is, likely to endure or persist. The second kind of social norm exists when a rule is followed and at least one of the beliefs upon which compliance depends is false. Let us call this a fragile social norm to reflect the fact that compliance with the rule is vulnerable to collapse if people become aware that the beliefs they currently hold are incorrect. The third kind of social norm exists when a rule is not followed but would be followed if the relevant social expectations were present. Let us call this a latent social norm to reflect the fact that compliance with the rule would emerge if people's beliefs were to change. Let me now turn to how I propose to extend Bicchieri's account of social norms to supplement Hart's theory of law. In the concept of law, before presenting his own account, Hart first examines what he considers to be its main rival, the theory according to which laws are orders backed by threats issued by a sovereign, that is, an individual or body of people who is habitually obeyed by all others within a territory and who habitually obeys no one. Hart offers a wide-ranging critique of this view, but the essence of his objection is that it cannot explain the most basic and familiar features of a domestic legal system. In order to make sense of the familiar features of the domestic legal system, Hart argues that we should conceive of law not simply as the coercive, as coercive orders issued by a sovereign, but instead in terms of two different types of rule. According to the first kind of rule, which Hart calls primary rules of obligation, quote, human beings are required to do or abstain from certain actions, whether they wish to or not, end quote. Hart concedes that the model of law as the sovereign's coercive orders can make sense of this kind of rule. One of the necessary conditions for a legal system to exist is indeed that the citizens of, of the society in question generally obey the law, and this relationship of obedience may resemble a subordinate habitually obeying the orders of the sovereign. However, according to Hart, the mistake the model of law as the so sovereign's coercive orders is to view law as consisting only in primary rules of obligation and to ignore the role played by a different kind of rule. Rules of this other kind, quote, provide that human beings may by doing or saying certain things introduce new rules of the primary type, extinguishing or modifying old ones, or in various ways determine their influence to, or control their, their operations, end quote. Hart calls these secondary rules because they are, quote, in a sense, parasitic upon or secondary to the first, end quote. 
according to Hart, the best way to understand law is by paying attention to both of these two kinds of rules and the interplay between them. As he puts it, quote, we accord this union of elements a central place because of their explanatory power in elucidating the concepts that constitute the framework of legal thought, end quote. Hart's view is that for a legal system to exist in a society, it is not enough that the citizens of society comply with primary rules issued by the sovereign. Instead, it must also be the case that a special class of individuals, the society's officials, complies with a set of secondary rules that are connected to the primary rules of the system in specific ways. There are three secondary rules in this set and they each serve a distinct purpose. The first, the, pur the purpose of the first rule is to remove uncertainty around how to identify those primary rules that are to count as laws of the system by specifying the features that constitute conclusive proof that a given primary rule is in fact a law. Hart calls this the rule of recognition. The purpose of the second rule is to facilitate change to the laws of the system by specifying the procedure via which laws are to be introduced and eliminated. Hart calls this, calls, calls these rules, rules of change. The purpose of the third rule is to rationalize and centralize the process by which violation of the law is identified and punishment for, for violation is enforced. Hart calls these rules, rules of adjudication. According to Hart, quote, law may most illuminatingly be characterized as a union of primary rules of obligation with such secondary rules. I want to suggest that we extend Vicieri's account of social norms to supplement Hart's theory of law by conceiving of the secondary rules that officials comply with as social norms, as Bicchieri defines them. That is, I want to suggest that the rules of recognition, change and adjudication are best understood as rules that officials comply with because they believe that enough officials comply with these rules and believe that officials should comply with these rules. This suggestion may seem inconsistent with how Hart himself characterizes the officials' relationship to secondary rules. There are in fact two dimensions to this problem, but let me just focus on one here in the interest of time. Hart argues that officials must regard the secondary rules of recognition, change and adjudication from what he calls the internal point of view. This means that the officials do not look upon these rules as if they were, as if they were external observers seeking to record how other people behave and seeking to identify so as to avoid the behavior likely to trigger sanctions. Instead, officials accept the secondary rules of recognition, change and adjudication as standards of behavior that other officials should follow. They do not merely regard failure to comply with these rules as something likely to trigger sanction, but as a good reason for those sanctions. While Hart allows that ordinary citizens may look upon the law entirely from the external standpoint, he insists that in order for a legal system to exist in society, the officials must regard the secondary rules of the system from the internal point of view. Regarding a rule from what Hart calls the internal point of view is equivalent to having what Bicchieri calls personal normative beliefs that correspond to it. For Bicchieri, having personal normative beliefs that correspond to a social norm is not necessary for compliance with it. Compliance with a social norm depends on normative expectations, beliefs about the presence of norm personal normative beliefs, and these expectations can be mistaken. For Hart, on the other hand, in order to be able to say that a legal system exists, it is necessary that officials have personal normative beliefs that correspond to the secondary rules of recognition, change and adjudication. That is, that they regard these rules from the internal point of view. As a first step to resolving the, the problem just raised, recall the amendments I made earlier to Bicchieri's account of social norms. I argue that we should relabel and disaggregate Bicchieri's account of social norms in a, way, in a way that yields the following three categories. Robust social norms are rules that people comply with because they correctly believe that enough others comply and believe they should. Fragile social norms are rules that people comply with because they mistakenly believe that enough others comply and believe they should. 
latent social norms are rules that people do not currently comply with, but would comply with if they believe that enough others complied and believed that they should. These categories help us to explain why, though officials' compliance with secondary rules is often, and in fact, ideally accompanied by personal normative beliefs that correspond to the rules, this need not be the case in order for a legal system to exist. While this suggestion constitute an amendment to Hart's claim that in order for a legal system to exist, officials must have personal normative beliefs corresponding to the secondary rules they comply with, I think this amendment is consistent with some of Hart's broader concerns. Moreover, and regardless of whether it is fully faithful to Hart's theory, I think this amendment is warranted because of how it enables us to identify different kinds of legal systems and to make sense of the circumstances within which legal systems persist, collapse, and emerge. To see this, we must first note, take note of Hart's discussion of what he calls the, quote, the pathology and embryology of legal systems. According to Hart, in the normal unproblematic case where we can say, where we can say confidently that a legal system exists, the rules recognized as valid at the official level are generally obeyed. But reality can deviate from this standard in a, num in a number of ways. Hart cites three ways this can happen, but the details of those need not detain us here. The important point to make for now is that Hart is very clear that it can be warranted to describe a situation as one in which a legal system exists, even if that situation departs from the normal unproblematic case. This is because the statement that a legal system exists is, quote, broad and elastic. I submit that officials complying with, secondary rule, with the secondary rules of recognition, change and adjudication as robust social norms is a feature of the normal unproblematic case for Hart. In this kind of scenario, officials have personal normative beliefs corresponding to the rules. I argue in the paper that it would not be plausible to insist that these personal normative beliefs must be sufficient on their own to generate compliance with the secondary rules. Instead, officials are comply with the secondary rules because they correctly believe that other officials comply and think they should. Secondary rules being complied with as robust social norms is a feature of the normal unproblematic case because it perfectly satisfies one of the criteria Hart sets out for that case. Officials comply with the rules and regard them from the internal point of view. Let us call a legal system in which officials comply with the secondary rules as robust social norms a robust legal system. Such a system is the normal unproblematic case and other things being equal is likely to persist. It seems to me that the categories of fragile and latent social norms are apt to make sense of some of the situations that deviate from the normal unproblematic case. Here, I will focus on fragile social norms only in the interest of time. Imagine a deeply oppressive legal system in which all opposition and dissent is brutally crushed. Initially, the officials accept the secondary rules of recognition, change and adjudication of the legal system and regard them from the internal point of view. But over time, they lose faith with the system and eventually cease to accept its secondary rules. However, because of the oppressive nature of the system and the fear of se the severe punishment deviance may trigger, none of the officials voices their misgivings. Instead, they continue to go through all of the motions and perform all of the operations required to keep the system going. Indeed, they do so enthusiastically in an effort to disguise the fact they have ha that they have had a change of heart about the system. Such a system is one characterized by pluralistic ignorance amongst the officials and in which the secondary rules are fag fragile social norms. The officials comply with the rules because they mistakenly believe that other officials believe they should comply and may sanction non-compliance. This kind of legal system is vulnerable to undergo a rapid and unexpected breakdown if officials' true personal normative beliefs are revealed to each other. And something resembling this is in fact what happened when the communist states of Eastern Europe collapsed. Let us call a legal system in which officials comply with secondary rules as fragile social norms, a fragile legal system. It is a considerable advantage of my suggestion that we conceive of officials as complying with secondary rules as social, as social norms, as Bicchieri defines them, that it is able to identify and make sense of this kind of scenario. 
In an effort to preserve Hart's claim that in order for a legal system to exist, the officials of the system must regard the system's secondary rules from the internal point of view, one might attempt to account for this example by concluding that, despite appearances to the contrary, commun the communist states of Eastern Europe were in fact not in fact governed by illegal systems. This is a deeply counterintuitive conclusion to reach, and one that seems to run counter to Hart's contention that a society can deviate from the normal unproblematic case and still have a legal system. Instead of drawing such a conclusion, I think it is better to make sense of such situations in terms of the presence of fragile social norms, giving rise to a fragile legal system. In the paper, I move on to explore the implications of my discussion of Bikiri and Hart for rule-focused activism, but I'll end my presentation here. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions and comments.